Hello and welcome to We Debate. I am Joe Munene. Now, global warming is increasingly being cited as a major cause of the numerous cases of droughts, floods, and other natural disasters being experienced across the world in recent times. And climate change advocates or activists have been warning that we are headed for an existential threat unless we do something about the adverse changes affecting our climate. But who is most responsible for these adverse impacts on the climate? And who should carry the burden and cost of fixing the problem? This is good for debates. The debate motion for tonight. Let it be resolved. Western nations caused climate change. They should deal with it. Our debaters for tonight are, on the affirmative side of the debate, we have Antec, National Coordinator, Kenya Platform for Climate Governance under PACTA. On the negative side of the motion, we have Professor Alfred Omenya, CEO, EcoBuild Africa and Sustainable Urban Development Expert. Antec, Professor Omenya, welcome to this debate platform. The motion before us, let it be resolved. Western nations caused climate change and they should deal with it. And you stand on the affirmative side of these debates in support. Professor Omenya, you are on the negative side of the debate. Now, just to give you a quick run through on the flow of the debate, we start off with the opening remarks. You have one minute to give your opening remarks. Thereafter, after the second uh, opening, we will go to your main presentation. You will have five minutes to capture the essence of your argument on the side that you're arguing on. We will start with you, and after the second presentation, we'll have a rebuttal, uh, your opportunity to respond to the respective arguments your opponent has put forth. At that point, we'll be at the halfway mark. The second half of the debate will largely be questions and answers. Now, as part of this debate, we have a panel of jurors, three jury members who will be evaluating and listening to your respective arguments. Prior to the start of the debate, we have polled the jurors to establish their position on this motion. And you start with a head start. And uh, two of the jury members are in support of this motion, and one is against. So, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> you have your work cut out to sway the rest of the jurors to your side of this motion. So, we circle back to you and your opening statement. Thank you so much and thank you for giving us this opportunity to participate in this debate. I want to say that climate change is real and as African countries we are feeling the real effect. Africa is one of the is the least contributor of climate change. We are contributing less than three percent of the greenhouse gases. The developed countries like China, USA, Germany, Japan are contributing 85%. So they are the greatest contributor of climate change. And with the principle the polluter pays, we have to go by it. So they have the greatest responsibility of paying for what they've polluted. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. The polluter pays. Professor Omanya, your opening statement. No, thank you, Joe. And, uh, Thank you, and the proposer and the, and the jury. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I just want to say up front that this is actually uh, an important and part of a big ongoing debate uh, that I've been part of uh, from around 2006 when uh, we had our COP, eight, uh, uh, our COP happening here in Nairobi, um, through Bali, through many places, through Paris, um, uh, South Africa, Mexico, uh, and in fact, back to the continent uh, again this year. Uh, for COP27. So this, this for me is just a slightly different platform from the big debate, you know, that is happening, you know, within these particular global spaces. So that is very, very interesting. Um, of course, when it, com it, uh, it comes to the motion that we're discussing today, uh, what is interesting is that uh, the politics of climate change, the development economics of climate change, uh, the science of climate change, is very clear on this issue already that uh, it is impossible for one country or one region you know to be able to deal with the vagaries of 
climate change, regardless of who caused the problem. In fact, for me, this is not even debatable. So I'm quite curious to see how Anne will be able to uh, convince the rest of the world that uh, you know, a segment of the world can carry the burden and take us to net zero by 2050. Looking forward, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Anne, uh, your five minutes presentation. Uh, thank you so much and thanks Pro, for putting that into context. Yes, I want to briefly descri describe what climate change is. Climate change is change of pattern in terms of weather for a, a long time and really caused by human activities such as burning of coal, uh, fuel like gas and uh, uh, coal. Um, these effects of climate change can be seen in, in uh, effects such as long droughts. We can see them in terms of uh, uh, prolonged rains. Uh, we can see them even in, uh, in terms of uh, weather changes. If you look at uh, the whole of Africa, they've been experiencing a lot of droughts. Uh, if you look at uh, South African countries, they've been experiencing a cyclone, such as Mozambique and other South African countries. If you come to Kenya, we, ha we are currently experiencing um, rising uh, lakes, such as the, north, uh, the, the rift lakes of Turkana, Baringo, um, uh, Elementaita. So already we are feeling that effect. Uh, on, the other, on the other note, uh, African countries are the most vulnerable, given that uh, we rely on natural resources uh, for, for, for survival. Most of our uh, economy, I mean, most of our money goes to buying goods and services. We are, stri we are trying to struggle and buy, I mean, use what we have to uh, put money on health, to put money on uh, education, to put money on uh, uh, infrastructure. So the same money that we should be using to develop ourselves, we are using it to, 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 to counter effects of the climate change. Uh, the, the, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Frameworks Convention on Climate Change, under Article 2, uh, is actually uh, telling the developed countries that you need to pay, uh, I mean, give some money, the climate finance, to the developing countries to, to counter this climate change uh, uh, effects. Uh, in 2009, during the Copenhagen, uh, the COP 2015, where developed countries pledged 100 billion uh, for every year annually until 2020, 2020 to curb the climate change effect. That has never happened. We are still waiting for those commitments to be done. So they're actually saying, yes, we did this and we need to counter the effect by compensating the developing countries. So you cannot say they did not. So they already did through their commitments showing that they're the ones who caused this and they need to pay it. So that's how I'll, I'll put it. All right. Yes. So you mentioned that they did not come through on the funding? They didn't. They okay. didn't fully come through. That's why they, during the COP26 in Glasgow, you were saying you've not uh, made your commitments. So we need to see that commitments come down. So already they're accepting that they're, they were part of these uh, destructions. And that, that particular, the quantification of that uh, commitment, is that uh, the, the full and final sum that uh, developing countries will be looking at? Uh, it was computed. It, this is an annual figure, 100 billion annually. Annually. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. so there are details of how they compute these figures. Okay. Yes. Professor, you are five minutes. No, thank you, uh, uh, the moderator, and thanks, Anne, for fleshing out that uh, issue and uh, for telling us, really, things that we already know, that uh, the West caused the problem largely and, uh, and uh, Africa is most impacted. Um, that those are actually true, uh, and, and I'll start building up from there. That yes, the West, the West did cause the problem. Uh, and and, and I, w I just want to make four quick points. Number one, that indeed, I agree with Anne, that the West caused the problem. Number two, um, ask what is actually the climate problem <laughs> and, and how are we you know, uh, contributing to worsening the or an already bad situation as it actually were. Um, number three, what is the responsibility of the rest? Uh, and, and, and lastly, you know, where does Africa fit in this uh, you know, equation as it actually were? Uh, but, but just quickly, um, just when we're starting to engage with this uh, climate change discourse, the biggest polluter on Earth was the US. As we are debating now, the biggest polluter is China. Um, 
uh, out of uh, uh, 10 countries that are responsible for 68% of the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, six of them are from and non-Western countries, starting with, with China, then of course you, you look at India, you look at uh, you know, countries like Brazil, you, you, all the way to you know, uh, Indonesia, um, South Korea, and so on. And, 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 and we are in a situation now where the runaway emissions, majority of them, are coming from developing countries. Climate change by its nature is a continuum. It is not like uh, the West the problem that was caused by the West is stopped and we are solving it, mm -hmm. and then after that we'll be clean and start dealing with the, you know, the problem that the rest of the, the world is actually uh, you know, causing. So even as we think about the culpability of the West, we must also think about the current responsibility of developing countries and, uh, and, and actually how these countries are developing and making this stubborn problem worse. So, I mean, if you keep uh, insisting that it's the West that actually, you know, caused the problem and they are therefore responsible, then we're running away from the problem that we're causing now for the future, ge future generations, you know, through our, our own runaway emissions. Let's, let us look at two protocols. Uh, let's, let us look at the Kyoto Protocol that actually recognized the, uh, uh, this particular position, that the West uh, was, was a problem. And indeed, the West was put in Annex 1 as the ones who are going to pay. And we realized that that Kyoto Protocol could not, was untenable. Why was it not tenable? It was because it only covered 14% of the greenhouse gases. And the entire world, not just me, the entire world agreed that actually, if we look at it from that perspective, we'll not solve the problem. Hence, the Paris Agreement that now has 194 countries, including EU as a bloc, and, uh, and that is covering 98% of greenhouse gases. So basically, starting to look at this thing collectively is the only way that we can be able to, you know, to resolve the issue. On the African side, um, we have this particular situation. We know now from history, we know from economy, we know from climate science, that the West developed on a totally useless trajectory. I was uh, involved in the African Union setting up the climate change unit there. What we are saying is that why can't we develop in a way that don't cause, exacerbate the problem? And there are very basic uh, ways of doing that. We can do our reforestation for, uh, for, in, you know, for energy and sequester carbon at the same time. Uh, already that same West you know, has paid for some of our pro programs here you know, to, uh, to capture energy, for example, through, uh, through geo geothermal. So what we are saying is that we can actually avoid that sort of uh, situation. And um, um, last but not least, I, I want to emphasize that the, the, of course, you we're bashing the West, and it, is, it seems quite fashionable, but uh, all the solutions that we have on the table have actually been put on the table by the West, <laughs> including that entire United Nations framework on climate change, and, 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 and they're the ones supporting the IPCC, and they're the ones support, uh, funding the Global uh, Climate Fund uh, through all these development partners. And I'll agree with Anne on this one. Is the West doing enough? From where I sit, I don't think so. But on the other hand, who will actually get the West to do enough? It is the same Anne and his people uh, who, instead of holding the West to do enough, um, you know, in this particular platform, let the West run away with murder. Mm -hmm. So in this particular instance, yes, the West should actually do more. But it, 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 is, it doesn't depend on the West to do more. The West will actually, uh, you know, push on their own priorities as opposed to, you know, pushing on climate change. So this, again, is failure for developing countries of, to, to ensure that the West, you know, deals with the mess that they did not just uh, create. Uh, what I'm actually saying, the West contributed significantly to creating the, cli the climate problem. I think uh, if we're to split hairs, we'll, we'll be asking that when the West was doing industrial revolution, was the entire world doing nothing? It's true that, th that the West was contributing significantly, but it it's also true that the rest of the world was also making some contribution. Thank you. I think we agreed in terms of the, 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 the role that the West, Western countries had over the last 200, even if you go back 250 years. And the big question here, what we are debating is whether they are doing enough to deal with it and who should be dealing with it. Right. So maybe, Anne, coming back to you and your opportunity to rebut on what you've had so far, uh, would you agree with that proposition? Earlier you had said that they are not actually doing enough. Yes, um, thank you so much. And thanks, Prof. I'm happy that... Uh, you're agreeing with me that the West <laughs> should actually uh, do more, <laughs> uh, although you're saying we, we also have to do it. Um, at the same time, you remember at some point the U.S. Uh, didn't want to sign into yeah. the Paris Agreement, and they were the greatest emitters of uh, climate change. So it, we had to do a lot of efforts to really make sure that they, they, are, they are signing to it. And I think when the new president came in Biden, he signed into it. 
So it takes a lot of push for, for, for these uh, developed countries to, to, to really commit. But I want to go back to what Prof said about uh, there are also other developing countries who are meeting. Uh, I'll give an example. We, we are given that uh, African countries meet around 2 to 3 percent, but that is cumulative within the 54 countries. But you find countries like South Africa, like uh, Egypt, and other big countries are meeting more than others. So you'll find that there are actually countries within Africa who don't emit, who are zero emitters of of uh, carb 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 carbon of the greenhouse gases emis gas emission. So I ag I want to agree with him to some point that we ha all of us have a responsibility responsibility, but we still push for the developed countries to put more efforts in terms of commitments and in terms of actions in pushing for uh, curbing of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, are we able to quantify the, what would be the right level of commitment from uh, developing nations, uh, developed nations? Uh, they, they promise 100 billion annually. Is that enough? Is it uh, below what is required? And I do acknowledge that this is a field that's evolving yes. uh, with a lot of science uh, required, uh, scientific data mm -hmm. required to be able to quantify uh, the impact. In fact, there are those who even say, is climate change real? Mm -hmm. uh, they see it as a conspiracy to control economic uh, destinies of nations. So my question to you, Anne, would be, what is this commitment that... Uh, developing countries would be looking from the Western nations. Uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll still go back to your uh, question that is climate change real? Climate change is real. We have the Intergovernmental pa pa Panel on Climate Change, which is a body of the UNFCCC, who do research and present these findings. They said, as we speak, the, the temperatures in, in, in the, on, the, on Earth are 1.1 degrees. And in the next 20 years, the Earth would warm to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It means that, and it says that Africa is the one that warms more, I yeah. mean annually. So already the effects are there. You, so they cannot claim that they are not effects and these are theories. So what, uh, in terms of uh, their commitment, yes, the 100 billion is a good seed to start with. But I know they can do more. Uh, I would take you back to the Kenyan uh, NDC. It's a commitment we made under the Paris Agreement that these are the uh, actions we are supposed to take. But in that uh, commitment, it was quantified mm -hmm. and found that we need almost three, uh, six, 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 63 billion annually to, to actually implement those actions. That shows that whatever they are committi committing is not even enough. It's just seed money but they can do more to commit more so that you're able to address these climate change risks. All right. Professor? Yes. Um, again, when it comes to the commitments and how the commitments are done, um, and here again, uh, I'll, I'll be on the case of Anne and his people, uh, because uh, how are the commitments done? On, on one hand, we have a situation where the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I will agree with her, um, you know, tells us uh, what we need to do um, the, the, the quantity that we need to cut, we know that to, to hit net zero, we need to cut 40, 45% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, and then, of course, we have technical actions that have been determined uh, by the panel. But then, of course, this goes through a whole lot of process in terms of, um, you know, technical committees that end up doing these negotiations and so on. And, uh, and eventually, it, uh, it translates into uh, actual commitments, like uh, Anna has promptly said there. Um, but then, how are commitments done and who's negotiating? Uh, yes, the negotiations start from technical people, but eventually it ends up to, with political people. Uh, it, it ends up being parties that are actually states represented by presidents and, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, ministers of environment that end up making the final resolution. How do politicians make decisions? Politicians don't make decisions on the basis of science only. Politicians make decisions on the basis of interests. So, uh, again, uh, when the West now is coming in to take their, their, their responsibilities, I think it's naive for anybody to think that the West would be seated there um, uh, whining and, uh, about Africa and, Africa's, uh, and the impacts in, in Africa and taking decisions that then would favor Africa. The West basically looks at their budgets, they look at their political scenarios and so on, and on that particular basis, they agree that uh, you know, this is exactly what they will undertake. But having said that, if you look at... Um, at the participation around the table, 
we are talking about some 200 plus odd countries. Out of these 200 plus, 54 are from Africa. <laughs> and, and, and 60 something are from Asia. So how, how, how is the West able then to, to take uh, uh, um, commitments that are not commensurate with their responsibility while all these people are actually watching? Is that a Western problem? Put yourself uh, in, in, in the shoes of President Obama in Copenhagen or uh, the, other, the other fellow, um, you know, uh, after ditching the, the Paris uh, uh, agreement, uh, Trump. Uh, will, do you think Trump will be worried about, uh, you know, some country in Africa that is being impacted by climate change? The first and form, foremost responsibility for the Western countries is politically, is actually to deal with their own local issues. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is where I consider it a failure of developing countries because we should actually go to the West with the science and with politics. We are always going to the West with science. And we know there is no politician around the world who respects science. In fact, many of them just use witchcraft. And, 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 and then we believe, we start whining because we are saying the facts are there, the facts are clear. How come these people are not uh, you know, responding to the facts? Mm -hmm. In fact, it is up to the politicians in Africa to actually proceed to the West. Uh, let me just illustrate this. We are working in African Union. Um, we are setting the climate change unit there. We have set up a committee of presidents, or it was called CAOS, Committee of Presidents, African President of Climate Change. We, the technical people give them the position. We are going to Copenhagen. What does uh, the chairman of that committee do, Mele Zenawi? He didn't present anything that Africa had said. Instead, he, he, he copied what the West were doing and, uh, and presented as the African position so that it could ap appease the West. That is how our politicians are playing with politics. So in that situation, do you blame the West for not listening to Africa or do you blame the African politicians for pursuing their selfish interests? All right, all right. So would you say that maybe our leaders don't have much choice? They have a lot of choice. In fact, uh, uh, to the contrary. Because what I'm saying is that uh, when it comes to the African leaders, they're failing in terms of playing global politics. And this is hurting the rest of the world. Because the truth of the matter is that uh, Africa is one side and, and, and even developing countries that have clung on science. We mm -hmm. are always quoting the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that gives us facts on, on, on the situation. And mm -hmm. it's true. In all the negotiations, Africans always have the fact. Mm -hmm. But when the resolutions are done, they're normally not in favor of Africa because Africans don't do the politics. <laughs> We don't do the politics uh, and, and to do the politics, you need to present a united front, exactly. strong position. Exactly. So it, could it be that we really are so divided that uh, we are controlled? Yes. That is, by, in, by in, the fact, the world. in fact, what we're saying here is that the, the, no, the normal, well-known African political problems and divisions have found their way into climate change, and that is not helping Africa's cause. So basically what happens is that if you are a Western country, you know, you, you commit what you think you can, and Africa will actually accept it. Those funds that she's talking about, and I agree 100%, uh, there was a commitment to do 100 uh, 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 billion US dollars as, as climate commitment. We needed uh, 68 uh, uh, billion or, or something like that per year. Um, but, but all the commitments was, was 100 million. How much of that came? Very little, we don't even know. It has not been quantified properly. But then, what commitment was given for, for developing countries for ad adaptation, for example? Yeah. It was a paltry 350 million, not even one billion dollar. Mm -hmm. And that was the main fund that was going to, uh, 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 to benefit uh, African countries and developing countries. If you go to the least development countries fund, that was even more negligible, it was zero point something. But you see, if, if you can't organize yourself and be on the table and demand for what you are entitled to, you don't expect the other side to do it for to you. To worry about you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, that marks the halfway point of this debate. We will be back in part two with a series of questions you'll have the opportunity to cross-examine each other, and then we'll take uh, questions from the jurors. I will ask a question which I'll ask now. We discovered oil some years back, maybe seven or eight years ago. What do we do with it in view of these climate concerns that we have? So I'll, I'll expect both of you to respond to what should Kenya do with its oil discovery. We take a break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the debate. A quick reminder for you to engage with us on these debates on our KTN Home social media pages. We start off this second half with cross-examination and straight away we go to you, Professor Omenya, your opportunity to ask the affirmative side one or two questions. How about uh, you? Thank you, moderator. I've got one or two questions for, uh, for Anne. Uh, and, and, and this is about honesty of uh, developing countries and aside to deal with the climate change issue. And um, these, are, these are the issues that, that, that uh, the first question really is um, when it comes to, uh, to the vagaries of climate change and the impacts it has on our people. You are looking at uh, issues of drought, you are looking at issues of uh, you know, water, you are looking at issues of food security and so on and so forth. Um, these are problems uh, linked with climate change and we see in many instances that uh, you know w when it comes to the climate change angle our governments are always waiting for development partners to come and assist um, uh, this is what i don't really understand because uh, a drought is a drought people are hungry regardless of what caused the hunger yeah. and at what point then does it become the responsibility of developing countries and this is also the same with climate change policies climate change programs and so on our governments are always waiting for the West to offer the lead in, in these processes. We don't see any proactive lead. We don't see, uh, we, we have very few climate change policies, climate change programs, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that is one. And, and, and you see, it doesn't really matter. These are normal programs that any problems any government would have, and we expect the governments to have mechanisms uh, in, in place to deal with them. That is one. The second bit, uh, and again, is something that we need to really uh, uh, indict ourselves about, is... Um, we have corruption, particularly in developing countries, in Africa and even in our countries. So somebody steals money that is meant to deal with food security, and then we blame it on climate change. <laughs> you know, to what extent is uh, poor governance, you know, co uh, creating more ravages than, 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 than even climate change as it was. So my point here is that um, it seems like people, uh, people like Anne and so on use climate change as scapegoat. For, for, for bad governors, that gov uh, government that produces thieves that steal from their own people and kill their people regardless of the extreme weather events or climate change. Thank you. All right. Anne? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Omenya. And uh, um, on issues of impact of uh, climate change and what we are doing as a country, I, I disagree with you. Because one, we've actually done enough. We've done a lot in terms of uh, putting policies in place as a country. So you cannot say we've not done much. I'll, I'll start with that. Why is because first, we are the first African country to have the Climate Change Act in place. We are, that is one of the most progressive climate change policy in Africa. And everybody is looking at Kenya to actually replicate the same in their countries. We have many policies and frameworks such as the National Climate Change Response Strategy, we have the National Climate Change Action Plan. We are now doing our third generation of Climate Change Action Plan. So we've already done enough to actually address climate change. As we speak, we have over 42 counties who already have uh, uh, delocalized the national climate change, and they're already responding to climate change effects. So we cannot say we've not done enough. We've actually, as a country, committed in terms of a policy framework on issues of climate change. And the issue of uh, why do we look at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, foreign countries to respond to, to effects of climate change like disasters? Sometimes, you know, a country, we don't have that money. I know the uh, Finance uh, Act has already allocated some money for disasters, but that may not be enough. Sometimes we need more than what is allocated. The Climate Finance Act has actually allocated like has request, has allocated 2% of the development money, even at each county, to respond to climate change. But you find that in most of the counties, that money is used for other, other purposes. So we, we don't have like a, ready, uh, a ready fund to respond to that climate change uh, effect. So, and that's why we keep running to the Western countries. On the, on the other question on uh, why do we steal uh, money that is meant to to respond to these disasters. I think that is just our internal, our, our internal project. I mean, a problem. It's not uh, it, because uh, 
I mean, it's just uh, to specific people who just loves to steal. And we have ways of uh, dealing with that. We have uh, institutions such as the, uh, the, uh, the, the ethics and anti-corruption uh, uh, bodies and, uh, and other bodies who, who respond to this issue. So we should separate issues of corruption and issues of climate change so that we, are sh we know where, where we are heading in terms of responding to these uh, catastrophes. But could we be, just to borrow from what uh, Professor was saying, could it be that we are attributing a lot of the challenges and incidents that we are seeing to climate change, whereas uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, bad governance? Uh, partially, it could, uh, I mean, if it, it, in terms of uh, weather changes, you can't say it's, it's a governance issues. In terms of flood, it's not a governance issues. But of course, there are issues that are governance related that could, we, could, we could organize ourselves and deal with climate change differently. But it may not specifically be, be because we, we don't have uh, structures or uh, governance in place. So we need to separate the two issues. So governance that uh, affects uh, the, the possible interventions that would apply. Yes, because, unless... I mean, floods have been there since before the word climate change became vogue. Uh, we always had floods, we had droughts and yes. that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, increasingly, it's all attributed towards climate change. Yes. But then there's the aspect that uh, even if you go to the, the, the big flood, uh, it has always been there. So my question, and just driving on what you were saying, is have we found an opportune excuse that also removes away the responsibilities, whether it's county governments, mm. to take interventions that uh, would help address the actual problem uh, as opposed to us looking to, to the Western nations? I agree with you. Yes, we need to, we already, like I said, we already have frameworks in place. We have structures in place, but we need to put our house in order. Like I said, if we need, we, we, we provide for the climate change fund, that money should be put there. And the structure, tru structures should be in place to address it. So I agree with you that we now okay. need to go to the next level of putting structures and, and, uh, in place so that we are able to respond. All right. Yeah. Okay, Anne, your one or two questions to Professor. Thank you, Professor. Uh, mine is... Uh, I know uh, as African countries, we are actually struggling with, uh, with issues of debts. Right. And uh, that's, that has really affected uh, uh, how we respond to climate change. What's your take on that in terms of balancing our debts, balancing building our economies, and responding to climate change? Then second, and not to go into the issue, issues of energy, clean energy versus uh, the dirty, dirty energy. How do you address that given that as, as, um, as African countries, we, we are yet to transition to clean energy uh, as per uh, the developing, uh, unlike the developed countries. Those are my two questions to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, I, I agree, of course, that, uh, that uh, Africa also has some other ch uh, challenges and is issues and so on. And, um, and what, what has been suggested, of course, uh, this is very clear even for, for the actual African countries that, uh, um, you know, you you must develop because that's the only way uh, you'll be able to cushion yourself from uh, the vagaries of climate change, the extreme, I mean, if your infrastructure is weak, if your services are weak and so on, then they'll, they'll be getting washed uh, away every, every, you know, every season. And uh, that, that becomes very costly in the, in the long term. So I think, I think the question that we should be asking ourselves is that, uh, uh, yes, Africa is uh, getting this internal debt and, uh, and external debt, and uh, a lot of that money is, 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 is used for infrastructure. But how is Africa building? Is Africa building better? Is Africa putting climate-proof infrastructure in place? Is Africa putting infrastructure in a way that enables Africa to adapt to climate change issues? Because those options are actually available. But what we are seeing uh, is a situation where African countries are getting these uh, you know, uh, huge amounts of debt uh, from, from foreign countries being paid by their own citizens and so on, and creating infrastructure as though we live one century uh, away. And there are even examples in Kenya where people are asking, why do you put that sort of infrastructure in 21st century, where people need to walk, where people need to go to the parks and all these sort of things, and you're creating a, an infrastructure that serves 1% and uh, contributes uh, immensely to greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So uh, what we're saying here, and that's the same thing we're discussing with African Union, is that wh what is preventing us from developing 
taking into consideration climate change because we are still going to use the, those same funds for development. So you are able to actually stretch that further. I think there's foolishness because all the mistakes have been made by the West and we can just see them. Uh, you know, all the infrastructure that we are talking about have been built, a lot of them by the West, and we can see them and learn lessons. The key question that we have is why aren't African countries, you know, getting into those, uh, into those uh, uh, um, uh, areas so that uh, for the same money you are able to actually d develop climate-proof infrastructure, you are also able to, uh, uh, to deal with, um, with uh, you know, your, your own development needs. On clean energy briefly, uh, definitely I think uh, Africa has always had very interesting uh, 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 sort of energy sources. And uh, Kenya now leads, literally. Uh, I think we are, we are in the top 10% in terms of exploitation uh, of clean energy. And, uh, and, and, and again here, I just want to, to say that in the same West that we are bashing, that has encouraged us to, to exploit our energy sources. I mean, the, our, our, our geothermal at Olkaria was funded by the Global Climate Fund, for example. Yeah, so, so, so the, the West is not always just available for bashing. In fact, it's the same West that, that, that is saying, guys, go slow on coal, even as they exploit their own coal. But having said that, uh, and, and goes to, to Job, the moderator's question around oil, uh, let, me, let me just add that because it's related to your question. Um, we are also very clear, and we agree, that, um, uh, and, and Arnold highlighted that, that, um, yeah, because Africa is just contributing 3 point something, that's, I think it's about 3.8% of the global greenhouse gas emission. And now with the current technology that we have, it is very, very difficult to, to go 100% green. So in some sectors, of course, like energy, we can definitely go green. But then, of course, when Africa gets uh, opportunities like uh, oil, gas, and so on, we must exploit those to some degree. But of course, uh, just, just with the understanding that it's impossible for any country to develop fully you know, on, on green. But, but what is important is the mix and how we are actually moving towards um, uh, that uh, contribution towards net zero. Thank you. All right. Anne, you're satisfied? Yes. Okay. Maybe just uh, quickly, the, the, the clean technology, right. a lot of it comes from the Western countries. Correct. So there's also that barrier that, uh, yes, we need to now adopt and develop right. clean, mm. but the cost of doing that with the new technology. Correct. Yeah, I, th I think, and, and I agree, and, and this is also one of the issues that, uh, that has been debated uh, forever, you know, within the UNFCC. And, um, and there was even a suggestion of, a, in fact, there is a technology fund, it's only that is, uh, it, it is actually very small. Um, I, I, and here again, uh, there's an the issue that, that uh, the West generates most of the clean technology. That clean technology is not generated by government, it's generated by private sector. Yeah. And the private sector is not, don't exist to solve Africa's problem. Private sector, even in the West, exists to make money. Yeah. So, so you have this very, very interesting uh, engagement between governments that are negotiating on the table and technology that is actually held in private hands, private hands. in the West. And, uh, and what has been, uh, has, has been Africa's, uh, particularly Africa's approach towards getting this technology is just been about whining to the West. And, and, uh, and some of these things are things that we actually need to solve, you, you, you know, both, both uh, with the understanding that this Western pri uh, uh, private sector um, the Western countries, to a large degree, are responsible for the problem, then how do you deal with this thing at the political level? Yeah. And, and that, that's what has been a problem, that uh, we, are, we are still weak, and I keep saying that. We are still weak when it comes to the political negotiating table. If you go to those uh, 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 sessions that are negotiating technology and technology transfer, you'll find that the same Africans who are making noises are missing around the table. You've got uh, 500 people, they're all universities from the US, from Japan, from, from China, they're, they're sitting there, they're deciding what they will, will do with technology. Meanwhile, the Africans are actually just whining and complaining and they're not on the table. <laughs> all right, thank you. We cross the floor now to the jurors and we will start with juror number one. I think uh, Kara will take your question. Just indicate the person to whom your question is directed to. Thank you very much. My name is Caroline Kibi. Uh, my question goes to Professor Omenya. Uh, we are gearing up to COP26, uh, in, sorry, COP27 in November in Egypt. And one of the key issues that will be discussed will be on loss and damage. So I'd like to know from you, what do you think we should expect from the developed countries as well as the global south? All right, go ahead. Yeah, of course, loss and damage has always been uh, on the table. For, for, for quite some time. And, uh, and, and in fact, it links with what Anne uh, uh, is talking about he here, whether you're, you're looking at the, um, ecosystem losses and so on. And, and then, of course, how that gets financed. Uh, 
uh, basically I think uh, uh, ultimately what we'll be targeting is that again you know uh, depleted funds that exist in uh, uh, not even depleted funds the funds are, are not there the adaptation funds because at, at the end of the day I mean how will you be able to pay for loss of damage you can quantify it of course it can be quantified and there are all sorts of uh, you know um, people already working in this particular area but then the, the question comes in terms of commitment uh, from the UNFCC and and then how that that actually gets uh, gets dealt with. Um, my own position is that uh, we, we already have quite some progress in terms of uh, funding of the ad adaptation fund, particularly for developing countries, and we need to, to see how that can be expanded to deal with lo loss and damage, and then of course see how this, this can be pushed further to, to, to commitments. All right. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Machora. My question is directed to Professor Omenya. And uh, my question is with regards to what you said that right now what uh, we need to do is that all countries need to take collective responsibility. Right. Because uh, we are not just blaming the West. But now what's happening is that the Western countries which are among the highest emitters right. are actually exporting pollution mm -hmm. to developing countries. So how would you then explain that? Because ultimately, that's why even China is saying that uh, they, they are not supposed to be classified as the major emitters because U.S. companies are actually setting up Correct. Mm -hmm. companies in China and they, and they are causing a lot of pollution. Yeah, I, I, again, thank you. And I think uh, I, I agree with you, Andrew, that uh, you see, uh, and also saying that we, we need to look at climate change at three layers. We need, to, we need to look at it in terms of science. And we know, we know what's happening in the realm of science. We need to look at it in terms of economics. And, and, and the issues there. And then we need to look at it from a political perspective. Uh, as it were, I mean, you, we know uh, there is, uh, there is uh, just a te general technology, but literally in every single sector. Uh, developing countries, particularly Africa, is a dumping ground. Be they f you know, used cars that are mo mostly efficient, that don't even meet you know, emission standards you know, in the West. They come here, be they airplanes, be they industries, you know, sugar factories, and so on. We get you know, second and stuff that uh, you know, that don't actually uh, meet, meet our requirements. Yeah, so, so, so that, that's one aspect. Uh, but, but then, of course, uh, you see uh, part of it, uh, a lot of our countries reason that uh, since, since we haven't contributed that much, it's okay. Let, let's get these, uh, you know, dilapidated technologies and so on. And even if you're polluting, you know, uh, at least uh, the equal share argu uh, argument that, uh, you know, we've not exhausted our equal share of pollution. <laughs> Or polluting the space is like saying equal share of the problem, <laughs> so we, we are contributing to the problem. So, so, so that's it. But, but if you look at it, a lot of that is actually advanced by the market. And, 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 and one of the things that I, I was always concerned about in, within the UNFCC system and the way it's been designed um, was carbon trading. Yeah, because uh, I'd argue that fundamentally there's something wrong with carbon trading uh, in this sense that uh, since you can buy somebody else's pollution or, or, or uh, you know, um, credit to pollute. Uh, this can be an incentive of polluting. I was saying, how do we know that uh, if, if these markets work properly, then there'll be less emissions? Mm. Yeah, so I think these are loopholes in the climate change uh, uh, agreements that are being exploited by the private sector. The pri private sector is selling us that, literally, because of these sort of loopholes, and we need to actually close some of these, these loopholes. All right, okay. Our final juror, Omar El Mawi. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, it's been an exciting conversation. And one thing I've learned today is that it's hard to be a juror because <laughs> several times uh, I've wanted to interject and came in with my own contributions. Uh, but understanding that you know, climate change causes a lot of economic impact as well, and this question is coming to you, Anne, um, in that Kenya, I think when I was reading the last, nation, the, uh, the last national determined contributions we sent, we are losing about 300 to 500 billion Kenya shillings every year due to the economic damages that are happening for the country. But the question then would be, um, A, um, the, we have heard you talk a lot about nations, uh, but I haven't heard people speaking about corporations. And therefore, without necessarily mentioning names, are corporations also involved in this uh, problem that you are in? Uh, or it's only uh, the, the, the West and, the, and, the, and the, the governments of these countries. And then secondly is the part about liability. Because we know when someone agrees to pay about uh, a harm that is happening, in some ways you are, you are actually 
uh, you know, confessing that you've caused the problem. And therefore, it might be the reason why many countries don't want to give the money so that they don't open themselves out for a lot of people, you know, uh, doing uh, cases and asking them to keep paying for all the damages that can be attributed to climate change. So in your own opinion, how do we really bypass this and make countries feel more comfortable in giving the money without necessarily being worried uh, that people will start witch hunting them uh, for any other uh, impact and losses happening anywhere in the globe? Thank you so much. And um, I'll start with your second question on uh, liabilities and should they even I mean, take those uh, responsibilities like you said. Uh, uh, she, she mentioned about the loss and damage. That's one of the big debates that is now coming in that uh, outside uh, mitigation and adaptation action, there should be a separate finance on loss and damage. And it's a big debate because the developed countries are, are talking about uh, are we really the, the causes of these uh, natural uh, disasters? Look at uh, cyclones, like I said, in, in, South, in, in South Africa. Look at what is happening in terms of uh, loss of properties and lives in, uh, in, in Baringo and even Bogoria. So are they saying, are they really the cause of this uh, climate change uh, uh, effects? So it's, it's, a, it's a big debate and uh, how to go about it is a, it would be an interesting uh, uh, I mean, a direct, a, a area to, to look at because the commitments that have been done, most of it is more voluntary. Most of it is in form of grants. So it's, it's just find a, finding a way that these countries can commit without feeling that they are really liable. But because they are very adamant to be forced to take up this responsibility. So you cannot really say they, they are ready to do this, but we need to find a way of voluntarily um, uh, letting them pay for these uh, damages. I, I gave an example of uh, the, the, the polluter pays principle, which is, which is a principle in the environment uh, field or other fields. Why can't we use the same uh, such principles to, to enable them to, to really pay or give them in incentives or other, other things to, so that they, they are able to pay? We have the red plus or the carbon, carbon, market, carbon trading, which is happening a lot, although it's not well defined like Prof said. Those are some of the mechanisms we should be looking at so that uh, they are able to say, I'll buy this number of emissions so that you're able to plant a tree or, or uh, I mean, use a renewable energy technology. So th those are, uh, I mean, um, ways of uh, enabling the, these uh, emitters to really pay for the, for the damage. On issues of cooperation and how are they involved? Yeah, there are specific corporations and big companies who are mining, uh, say, coal or other, other minerals who are responsible. They are not only countries, it's only that we put these countries which, are ha which are have this big cooperation most of them are in these developed countries. So it's not a country per se, but also these big corporations uh, working in these countries or represented in these countries. I hope I've answered your question right. Okay, thank you, Omar. Uh, Anne, what do we do with our oil in view of these climate concerns? Interesting, because uh, like we said, the um, Oil, we still have oils. You look at uh, Kenya, we, we, we are trying to exploit. If you look at Nigeria, Liberia, we have most of the oils already, uh, I mean, underneath. But the developed countries have already gone ahead and used theirs and moved ahead to develop their economies. So it's a very interesting question because if we are to explore the oil, we are saying we are emitting. So we need to balance that. And at the same time, we need to build our economies so we need to balance between exploitation and emission. So it's, it's a way of uh, um, ensuring that we can still exploit, but ensure that we balance the emission in the... So in, in your view, are we making that case strongly that we need to exploit even as we balance out? I know that there are conversations where we are saying we need to transit to clean energy. And uh, what we are saying as civil society is we need just transition just means uh, already you are ahead. So give us time, uh, invest in uh, these technologies in, in terms of finance, invest in capacities, invest in, uh, I mean, in ensuring that we, we, these technologies of renewable energies are transferred to the African countries. So it's still a big conversation that we are still having, but yes, we need to transit, but um, 
uh, in, a, in a strategic way. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the jury members. That brings us to the end of the question and answer session. Now, uh, Anne, your opportunity to summarize your arguments uh, in your closing statement. You have one minute. Uh, thank you once again. It's been an eye-opener. And uh, even as we move towards COP27 COP in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, I think as African countries, we need to push for uh, some of these actions, include especially climate finance, we need to ensure that these countries, uh, developed countries, commit to what they made in terms of climate finance. We need, for, we need to push for the um, loss and damage fund, which we had proposed during COP26 in Glasgow. We need to push to ensure that uh, the marginalized groups, uh, people, young people, uh, women, and girls are involved in this conversation of uh, climate change. So as Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, we've been working with African countries to ensure that we have, we go as one voice in, uh, as Africans. That's why we are calling it the uh, COP, the African COP, uh, where we are trying to bring together the voices of Africans to speak as one during COP26, COP26, COP27, sorry, in Sharm el-Sheikh. Thank you so much. All right. Professor, your closing statement. No, thank you. And, uh, and it's very clear that uh, my side of the debate uh, really uh, explained that uh, you know, uh, if, if, if they don't join to solve the, clim the cl climate crisis, it won't be solved. So I think that bit is settled. <laughs> but the only issue to, to their side and, and, and to African countries is that, um, look here, you're going to develop anyway. So you have a choice to either develop dirty or develop clean, as it actually were. You are still going to deal with your forestry, you are still going to deal with, with your water issues, your food security, energy, and so on. And you have a choice of going clean and the beauty with it is that there's additional money that comes from there or you continue developing in your stupid old dirty ways and blaming it on the West. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Professor, for your insightful debates. We have to bring it to an end at this point. The jury, the jury panel has voted. At the beginning of the debate, two jurors were in support of the motion, one was against. Have the debaters managed to win over the jurors with their argument? I think, Professor, you put in a strong uh, debate <laughs> performance because at the end of this session, none of the jury members is in support of the motion <laughs> and all the juries are on the negative side, on Professor's side. So obviously, a lot more conversations around this particular topic and uh, we thank you for your input. Well, that's the position of the jury. Do you out there, the viewers, agree with it? We welcome your feedback, your comments on this debate. Please engage with us on the social media handles appearing on your screen right now. Well, that's it for now. Thank you once again to the two debaters, our panel of jurors, the KTN team behind this production, our location host, the Norfolk Hotel, and obviously, most importantly, you, the viewer, for tuning in and participating in this conversation. Thank you. I'm Joe Monene, and we'll see you.